in this lecture we're going to start to focus on organic molecules and you're made of four types of organic molecules proteins carbs lipids and nucleic acids we're going to look at in general what it means for a molecule to be organic and how these organic molecules are formed and then we're just going to give a brief overview of some characteristics related to organic molecules and then I'm going to get into the specifics about carbs. First, these molecules that you are made of, because that's the, the idea behind this unit, is we're studying the different molecules that make up living things. These molecules can either be classified as inorganic or organic molecules. Molecules are considered inorganic if they do not contain carbon and hydrogen. So here's some examples, and these molecules are important. It's just they do not contain hydrogen and carbon, so they're considered inorganic. Organic molecules do contain carbon and hydrogen, and these molecules are primarily made by living organisms. Organisms can make these organic compounds that contain carbon and hydrogen. So if you look at these chemical formulas, you can see that there's both carbon and hydrogen in each of those molecules, so those molecules are, are considered organic. You also need to be able to look at diagrams of these molecules and as long as you see carbon and hydrogen then you're going to consider those those molecules organic. Let's practice down here. I have some chemical formulas and some structural formulas. So NaCl, now you got to be careful because that Cl doesn't stand for carbon and then another element it stands for chlorine. NaCl is sodium and chlorine. There's no carbon and hydrogen so it's considered inorganic. The next molecule has carbon and hydrogen, so it's organic. This one is missing both hydrogen and carbon, so it's inorganic. We have, again, carbon and hydrogen, so we have organic, carbon and hydrogen, organic, and we do not see carbon and hydrogen, so this one is inorganic. So like I mentioned earlier, living things and their cells are made up of four types of organic molecules. From here on out, these are the types of molecules that we're going to study. So proteins, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids. These molecules are made of atoms, and primarily the atoms that make up these molecules are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And here in a little bit, you're going to be able to tell me exactly which of those atoms are found in carbs and lipids and nucleic acids and so on. But what all of these molecules have in common is that they're primarily made, or, or they're, the backbone is carbon. All these molecules are going to have carbon in, in common. So why are our molecules that make up us, why are they primarily made of carbon? How come we're not oxygen-based or how come we're not nitrogen-based? Well, it's basically because of two main reasons. First of all, carbon offers stability in these molecules that it makes up because carbon has the ability to form covalent bonds. And remember, we said that covalent bonds compared to ionic bonds are stronger bonds. And so these molecules that make us up, we want to make sure they don't disassociate and fall apart. We want them to be structurally stable. In addition, carbon has the ability to form double covalent bonds and triple covalent bonds, which are even stronger bonds than just a single covalent bond. If you see in a diagram a carbon and there's two lines between it and another, atom, then it's signifying that that's a double bond. A, a triple bond is written with three lines. So it offers stability and it also offers variability. Now we have lots of different processes that have to take place in our body, so we need lots of different types of molecules that can assist in these processes. What I have written here says variation in these different classes of molecules offers a wide range of functions. So it allows for lots of different processes to happen in our body because we have lots of different molecules with different structures um, that can assist in these functions. So there's a lot of variability when you're dealing with carbon. It can bind with itself, but it can also combine with lots of other elements. So you can get a lot of combinations of atoms making these molecules with different structures. It can also bond, something that's unique about it, is it can bond to four other atoms at one time. It's not just limited to bonding with one other atom, um, like hydrogen, for example. It can bond up to four other elements at one time. If you take a look at this diagram up here, you can see that carbon can can form four covalent bonds with four different atoms. And again, that just offers a lot of uh, variability whenever these molecules are, are forming. 
Now, it has four valence electrons, and the reason why it can bond with four other atoms is because it needs to share, it needs to get four other electrons. All this carbon that is found in your organic molecules started off as inorganic CO2 in the atmosphere. And we have organisms like autotrophs that can actually take inorganic CO2, and it's inorganic because it's missing hydrogen in this case, and can convert it into organic molecules. Now, you probably recognize that equation there for photosynthesis, but I'm going to change it a little bit because it's not just sugars being created. All of your organic molecules can be formed through processes related to photosynthesis. And taking this inorganic CO2 and then converting this carbon into organic molecules that are, that are made of carbon. Now, one thing that I want to point out, just because I can see this being mentioned in some kind of question on a future AP exam, is that some scientists believe that life in other, in other parts of the universe, they might not be carbon-based, like we're carbon-based. They believe, now if you, if you take a look at this periodic table, you might guess. So what do these scientists believe might be the backbone element for living organisms and another you know, planet in the universe? And they think it might be silicon. And here's the reason why. Because they're, they're located in the same column on the periodic table, silicon also can bind with four other atoms at one time. It also shares electrons, so it forms covalent bonds. Since it has a lot of characteristics similar to carbon atoms, they think that life on other planets might not all be carbon-based. They, um, they might be based on, on silicon. So here's kind of an overview, um, some of the main big ideas that you need to remember about proteins, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids. And then, like I said, I'm going to then specifically focus on carbohydrates, uh, the last part of this lecture. So we already said that these biological molecules consist mostly of these elements. Now these, these elements, these atoms, come together to form small, basic organic molecules, which we call monomers. And if you remember, mono means one. And so we can take these small molecules, I can take one of them, and I can attach another one to it. I can attach another one to it. And eventually, I can form a really big molecule from putting these smaller molecules, these monomers, together. So these monomers come together into these bigger molecules that make up our bodies and our cells, and they're called macromolecules. And remember, macro means big. So when I'm talking about a protein, I'm talking about a pretty big molecule. Now, when I'm, I'm addressing these proteins and carbs and lipids and clake acids, there's, there's lots of molecules that are classified as proteins. And some of these molecules you know, have a certain function in the body, and then some of them are more like structures. So I'm just kind of showing you how for these different types of macromolecules, there's, there's some that serve you know, more of a, a functional purpose, and then there's others that you know, are considered a structural molecule, and your cell structures are actually built of these molecules. When you we look at this, this second column here, some provide a red, readily available energy source. We're talking about our carbohydrates. So a big idea that you need to remember is that carbohydrates serve primarily as our energy source. But there's actually some parts of your cells that are actually made of carbohydrates. We uh, talked in pre-AP when we were talking about the cell membrane, the marker proteins, the marker proteins sometimes are drawn kind of as circular blobs with these little chains hanging off of them. Those chains are a sugar. So some parts of your cell structures are actually built out of carbohydrates. Now, carbohydrates are made of the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And you're going to find these in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So here's what I mean by that. If I write the formula for glucose, it's C6 H12O6. And you can see that if you reduce, I'm going to have a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So you're going to see that in all carbohydrates. Now the simplest carbs, the monomers of carbohydrates, are monosaccharides. And we're going to get into those monosaccharides today because we're going to focus on carbs here after we give you a, an overall glance at these four types of organic molecules. 
The second type of macromolecule is proteins. We have some proteins, it's their function to assist in chemical reactions. And if you remember, these proteins were called enzymes. And there's some proteins that make up structures in the body. So your, some of your parts are built of proteins. A lot of connective tissue is, is made of a protein. Now the elements you're going to find in proteins are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And so it takes these elements coming together to form these monomers that make up proteins. And you might remember that amino acids are the monomers that we use to build our proteins. The next one, it says an energy, energy source, a long-term storage of energy. We're talking about fats. And the more scientific name for fats is lipids. So we have lipids that provide energy. And then we also have lipids that make up structures in your cell, like those phospholipids in the cell membrane. And when we look at the elements that make up these lipids, primarily you're going to see most lipids are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And it can get confusing because I just said that sugars are, are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and so are lipids. So how are you going to be able to tell the difference between the two if I show you a picture of a carbohydrate and a lipid, which I'm going to show you here in just a second, is if you see a higher ratio, if you see a really high ratio of carbon and hydrogen atoms, you're going to be looking at a fat. And I'll show you, this will make more sense when I show you a diagram of a fat. I'm going to put a P for uh, phosphorus because if you remember, we've talked about phospholipids before, and that is a type of lipid that also has phosphorus in it. I mean, it's kind of an exception. It's got an additional element compared to other fats. The monomers that make up, or the subunits that make up our bigger lipids are called fatty acids. And then finally, the last group, and again, we're just giving you a general idea and just jogging your memory because you've had this before in your pre-AP class. So that last organic or type of organic molecule are the nucleic acids. And so you see that many of them function to, there's a typo there if you want to change it to store, store our genetic information and they transfer it from the nucleus to the ribosome. There are some nucleic acids that serve as structures. A ribosome is, is made of some protein, but it's also made of ribosomal RNA. Even some nucleic acids can exist as structures in our cells. Now, if you remember, we would take nucleotides and we'd build DNA in class, and those nucleotides have three parts. There was a phosphate group, there was a sugar, and there was a nitrogen-containing base. When we think of the elements that make up nucleic acids, we need to think of, we've got the sugar, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Remember the nitrogen base, I'm going to put that here, and remember the phosphate group. So it looks like chopping. Well, that's what I envision when I think of the elements that make up nucleic acids. I, I think of chopping. So the nucleotides are the monomers that we're going to use to build bigger molecules like DNA and RNA. All of your molecules are made of these elements. Well, how do these elements get into you as these molecules. All elements are taken up by autotrophs from the environment. So here's what I mean by that. Autotrophs, like plants or even some bacteria considered autotrophs, they're able to take these molecules out of the environment, like CO2, and actually then use the carbon to make these organic molecules, these proteins, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids. Like for example, bacteria, they can take nitrogen right out of the air. And that, those nitrogen atoms will ultimately end up being in um, the amino acids of the proteins that make up these bacteria. Phosphorus is pulled out of um, the environment and it's used to build these molecules that contain phosphorus. You need to understand that all of these elements, they're recycled. The carbon that's in your body right now, these carbon atoms, after you're you know, dead and gone, these carbon atoms are gonna end up in another living organism. And it's just, it's just a big cycle. Now, I actually have a picture of these cycles. And 
I do not want you to spend any time trying to memorize these. You are going to memorize these, but you're going to do so in the ecology unit. But right now, this is what I need you to understand. If something was to interfere with a carbon cycle, then that would interfere with the making of every single one of these organic molecules because every single one of these molecules contains carbon atoms. If something disrupt the nitrogen cycle, then um, you would still be able to make carbohydrates just fine and lipids because they do not contain nitrogen, but it would disrupt the making of proteins and nucleic acids because those molecules have nitrogen atoms in, the, in them. With the phosphorus cycle, you need to know that that would interfere with um, the formation of clake acids because they have that phosphate group onto the sugar and the base on those nucleotides. And remember that there is one lipid that has phosphorus, one of those phospholipids, and so it would also interfere with the production of phospholipids. Again, you more have to just be able to relate the fact that these cycles are providing elements to make different molecules, and you need to know which elements are found in each of those types of organic molecules. If you have that memorized, then this is going to help you take a look at these, uh, these structural diagrams of molecules and be able to tell me whether they are a protein, a carb, a lipid, or a nucleic acid. So let's do some practice here. Looking at this first diagram right here, I see carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Just from that information alone, I can tell that this is a protein. It's a very short protein. And we're actually going to go through the structures of proteins. And by the time I'm done with you, when you're studying for your tests in a couple weeks, you would even be able to tell me that this is two amino acids and that there's a peptide bond between the amine group and the carboxyl group. So there's a lot more information coming. But just in general, from what I've taught you so far, if you remember that proteins contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, you should be able to look at this top diagram and say that's a protein. So moving on to this diagram here. We see that there's a phosphate group. We've got nitrogen over here. If you start writing it out, you've got chopping. And we said that this is related to nucleic acids. You have a molecule here that's related to nucleic acids. And as a matter of fact, what you have here is you have one nucleotide. Remember, the nucleotide had the phosphate group. Here's the sugar. And here's the nitrogen base. Still, more information is going to be coming up. Uh, during a, a future lecture about nucleic acids. So moving down here. Now, if I look here at this molecule, then I'm going to see I have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. You can actually count them if you want to count them, and you're going to see you have a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So you have a carbohydrate. Whenever I look at this diagram, uh, I don't have to count. I see that there's, you know, there's no nitrogen, there's no phosphorus. It's probably a fat or it's a carb because fats and carbs have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Another defining factor is see how these molecules are written as rings. Lots of times we diagram sugars as rings, or they, they have a, a structure that resembles a ring. Up here on this nucleotide right here, this is, this is the sugar, and you can see that it's in ring form. So sometimes um, when we're showing the structure of carbohydrates, we'll show them in ring form, and we'll also show them in linear form, and I'll show you that here in a little bit. If you're looking at this next diagram, you see saturated and unsaturated. So you might already know a little bit uh, just from you know, paying attention to your diet and what you're eating, and you might know that that, is, that has to do with the fat. Here we have a lipid, but I want to point out a few things. Remember I said lipids have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but you're going to find a higher ratio. So you're going to have a higher ratio of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So here's what I mean by that. These chains, so these are actually the fatty acid chains that we're going to talk more about. These sometimes are called hydrocarbon chains. And if you look at that boxed in area, you can see why. It's got lots of hydrogens connected to carbon atoms. You can see that we just have, there's just four little oxygen atoms here, but we have way more carbon and hydrogen. We're definitely looking at a lipid. Now on this next diagram right here, you remember that we would look at codons and we would look up the codon AUG. And do you remember what amino acid you would find next to AUG on that codon chart? And maybe you remember it would be MET, it was methionine. Methionine is the first amino acid in a protein. And so we're looking at 
one way that people like to diagram proteins. They like to show them as chains of amino acids. Now, we're going to learn way more about the structure of proteins, and you're actually going to build a model that looks like this kind of, this is called a ribbon model. If you see a, a chain of amino acids, or you see something diagrammed like this, you can bet that they're asking you a question about a protein. So if we start to analyze, and you might take a second to pause and just see if you can figure out on your own the next two molecules. They should be pretty simple. But if we just look at the elements, we can see there's some phosphates. We have some nitrogen here. We have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So here are the elements in this molecule. You have a nucleic acid. And some of you maybe have figured out by now that you're actually looking at ATP. So ATP, it's a nucleotide. Here is the phosphate. Here's the sugar. And here's the nitrogen base. And it has two additional phosphate groups added. So it has three phosphate groups total. Remember, um, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And it's a nucleic acid. And then finally, the last diagram should be a simple one. Um, I know it's kind of hard to see some of the symbols for the elements, but right here, there's a P there. So this is the phosphate. Here's the sugar. Here's the nitrogen base. And so this would be one nucleotide. You might recognize some of the names of these nitrogen bases. A goes to T and G goes to C. So you're definitely looking at a nucleic acid. And specifically, you're looking at DNA. Just by knowing the elements that are common to these molecules, you should be able to look at diagrams and um, decide whether you're looking at a protein carb lipid or a nucleic acid. So now we're going to talk about how these monomers that we identified on that chart for each type of organic molecule, how these monomers come together to form these big molecules. So I've mentioned before that most of these organic molecules, like your proteins and your lipids, they're very large molecules, and sometimes we call them macromolecules. So if I'm talking about the macromolecules of your body, I'm just talking about your proteins, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids. Now these really big molecules are made of smaller molecules, and I've mentioned before those smaller molecules just have a general name, which they're called monomers. And these monomers come together to form these big molecules. You see a diagram here, and I'm just kind of attempting to show you in this diagram that we have a small molecule. So this is just a small molecule. It's going to be made of atoms, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, maybe nitrogen. And they're pieced together, and now we have a big molecule. Sometimes I refer to it as a polymer. Don't get confused about whether we should call it a polymer or a macromolecule. A polymer is just any molecule that is made of repeating subunits, like repeating monomers. So any molecule with repeating subunits is called a polymer. Remember, mono means one, so there's monomers come together to make a polymer. Poly, mean, poly means many. And sometimes those polymers get really, really big, and so then we call them macromolecules. And again, so let's take a look at how these monomers actually come together to form these macromolecules. Molecules in the body are constantly being formed, and they, they're done so through a process that we call dehydration synthesis. Dehydration synthesis. Let's just think about what these two words mean. Synthesis, or to synthesize, means to make. So we are making a molecule with these smaller molecules. So think of building a, a big building out of small pieces, like Legos. And dehydration means to remove water. If you're dehydrated or you're becoming dehydrated, it's not because water's going into you, it's because water's coming out of you. So dehydration means to remove water, synthesis means to make. So let's take a look at what happens whenever I take two monomers. Monosaccharides are the monomers of carbohydrates. So here's a monomer. So I'm just going to put mono. And here's another. So here's a monomer. And here's a monomer and we want to hook those two together. Note this diagram before versus after. And particularly, we're going to look right here. What is going to happen is that in this process, a water molecule is going to remove, be removed. Remember, water is H2O. So from this area between these two atoms, two hydrogens are going to be removed, and an oxygen, and a bond is going to be formed there. In this situation, it's, it's going to be a covalent bond. That is why you'll see equations and you'll see, okay, so we made a new molecule called a disaccharide, and then you also get water. 
Water is removed in the process of making a molecule. Here's another diagram right here that's just showing you the exact same uh, process. It's just showing you a different way. We've linked two monomers together. We've done so by removing water. And here's that water molecule that's, that's being removed. The opposite of dehydration synthesis is called hydrolysis. And you know what, before I get into hydrolysis, let me go back real, real quick. And I want to add, we can also call dehydration synthesis, we can also call a condensation reaction. Now, if you think of condensation, you might be picturing a cold pop can on a warm day. And water's forming on the outside of that pop can. And that's called condensation. Since water's being formed, when we're piecing these two molecules together, sometimes it's called a condensation reaction. So dehydration synthesis or a condensation reaction, we're talking about the exact same thing. All right, the opposite of dehydration synthesis um, is a process that's called hydrolysis. And notice that um, this is just the reverse of the reaction that we had in this top diagram. So see how the arrow is just reversed? So here I have a molecule, and I want to break it back apart into its two monomers. So I want to go in this direction, the reverse direction. Well, if we had to take out water to link these two monomers together, now we're going to have to add water. So we have to take water plus this molecule that we want to break apart, and here is that water has been broken apart, and it's forming bonds with some of the atoms on those monomers. What I have in this diagram is just simply another way to show that this is showing you hydrolysis, that to break these two monomers, so here's a monomer, small molecule, Here's another monomer. To break them apart into individual monomers that are no longer linked, we're going to have to add water. And you can see that we've added water in that area right there. Now, if you think about hydrolysis and break apart that word, hydro has to do with water. If you're being hydrated, that means that you're, be, you're being given water. We are giving water to break apart, and lice means like to break or to cut. So we're cutting apart these monomers by adding water. Okay, so this last diagram is just um, just kind of a, a big idea diagram to make sure that you understand that you are recycled food. You are recycled carbs, you are recycled fat and proteins from your diet. And so these really, really big molecules are digested by your digestive system. They're broken down into the monomers that built up these molecules. These carbohydrates, whenever they're broken down into these small molecules, these monomers, now you have a bunch of monosaccharides that you can reuse for different purposes in your body. And you can even use some of those monosaccharides to build molecules that you need in your body. Lipids are broken down into small molecules into the monomers, and we talked about those are called fatty acids, and then you reuse those fatty acids for different purposes. The protein that's in your steak, those amino acids, or that protein's gonna be broken down into amino acids. Those amino acids are gonna be dropped off at your cells via your blood and you're gonna reuse those amino acids and build your own proteins. This doesn't exactly happen with your nucleic acids. When you're, you're eating food, you're eating cells, and there's nucleic acids in cells. So technically, you're getting nucleic acids in your diet, but you don't break down necessarily nucleic acids into nucleotides and then reuse those exact same nucleotides. Your cells actually synthesize uh, nucleotides. So this chart's just basically helping you understand that you take these big molecules that are made of monomers, you break them down into the individual monomers, and then you reuse them to build your own molecules. Now, this page I'm going to skip for now. And after I go through each organic molecule, I'm going to come back here and we're going to review just general ideas about the structure of these types of uh, molecules. You have the structures and, and the names of many of these molecules all on one page. It would be helpful to see them all on one page whenever um, you're studying this information. So we're going to go ahead and jump all the way down and we're going to start talking about carbohydrates and then when I'm done I'm going to go back and I'm going to fill in that carbohydrate box on that previous page. Again, I can't emphasize this enough, these molecules are made of smaller molecules or subunits that are called monomers. And each of these types of organic molecules, carbs, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, they each have their own monomers with their own names. So you need to associate the monomers of carbohydrates are called monosaccharides. 
And remember he said carbohydrates are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and it's always going to be in that one to two to one ratio. There's lots of monosaccharides, but I'm just going to mention five of them. And even with these five, I'm going to strike through a couple of them just because I don't think that they are as important as these other three. You're going to see these other three in other units throughout the year. So here's some common monosaccharides to be able to recognize. Glucose, fructose, galactose, ribose, and deoxyribose. Now, to confuse you, in science we like to give things the same thing, two to three different names. And so these monosaccharides, we also can call them simple sugars. And we call them simple sugars because they're going to taste sweet. So if you put glucose on your tongue or fructose on your tongue, you're going to register a sweet taste. Now, I mentioned before, it's sometimes easy to recognize carbohydrates because you, you will see them in ring form like you're seeing here. This is what we mean by ring form. But they also can be shown in linear form. So this is an example of these molecules, glucose, fructose, and galactose, shown in the linear form. And again, the main thing to understand is if you can just recognize that those molecules are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and it's in a, a one to two to one ratio, then you're dealing with a carbohydrate here. Now, I know that most of you probably haven't had organic chem, but I do want to point out everywhere that there's a intersection there, there's a carbon atom there. So in case you're wondering where all the carbon is at, it's just they don't show it all the time. I do want to point out with glucose, fructose, and galactose that we have here, every single one of them has the exact same chemical formula. They all are C6H12O6. And it's just the atoms are arranged differently, so they have different structures. Now, anytime we have a molecule with the same chemical formula as another, but these, these atoms are in different arrangements, we call these molecules isomers. And remember, iso means the same. And we are going to talk about isomers later on. Towards the end of this unit, we're going to be doing a lab, and it utilizes isomers. So you're going to have different molecules that have the same chemical formula, but just structurally, structurally they're a little bit different from one another. So again, recognize some names of monosaccharides, and then maybe a big idea that you need to know about them. And again, fructose and galactose, not so important to remember, but the main ones to really focus on would be monosaccharides like glucose. And you've seen, even just in this lecture, I've shown you already the equation for photosynthesis. So if you don't have it memorized, you need to memorize it pretty quickly. A big point you need to remember about glucose is glucose is manufactured through the process of photosynthesis. And then both plants and animals will take that glucose and utilizing oxygen in this process, they will convert it into ATP and they need that ATP for energy because cell structures run off of ATP. You also get water and you get CO2. So here's your equation for respiration. Again, we're going to reference it a lot, so you might as well memorize it now. All plants and animals need that glucose to make that ATP, which is energy. So we use glucose as energy. You probably heard of blood glucose levels. That's because glucose is circulating around in your blood and it's being delivered to your cells and your cells will take that in and convert it into ATP. You maybe have heard of the other monosaccharide that I, that I was talking about crossing through, um, fructose. You probably heard of high fructose corn syrup. Fructose is, is a common sweetener. We can get it from corn, and if you've driven down the road any time lately, you see that we can grow a lot of corn around here. So it's really easy to grow and manufacture and isolate pretty cheaply. So that's why we use fructose more often than we use sugar sucrose, which we usually get from sugarcane plants. The other monosaccharide, remember I said, they're not so important for future units. Um, we, we mentioned galactose. And I'm just going to put a cross through there again, emphasize it's not as important as maybe these other three. And I just have to talk about galactose because I'm going to relate it to milk sugar here in a little bit. You've probably heard of people being lactose intolerant. They can't digest the sugar that's in milk, and that sugar is called lactose. And we're going to talk about more about lactose here in just a little bit. There's sugars in nucleic acids, and so the sugar that is in RNA and ATP, that R right there, if you remember, stands for ribonucleic acid. Ribose is the sugar that is in RNA. As a matter of fact, it's right here, and it's showing you, showing you the structure of it in ring form. And then here is an ATP molecule. And ATP, again, it's, it's a nucleotide with some additional phosphates attached. It has a sugar, and that sugar is right here. So there's ribose. Whereas DNA has deoxyribose. 
as its sugar. And again, that's where the D comes from. In DNA, it stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And so there is the sugar right there in that DNA molecule. The main idea to understand about monosaccharides is the monosaccharides are the monomers, and they're going to come together to build these larger molecules that we're going to talk about on the next pages. So now we're going to move into disaccharides. So again, these are carbs, and let me go back a little bit and say I'm going through, there's three main structures to carbohydrates. We have the monosaccharides, which are the simple molecules. We're going to have disaccharides, and then we're going to have polysaccharides. Now, to get this, these disaccharide molecules, then what we're going to do is we're going to take two monosaccharides. So let's show that. Let's diagram. Here's a monosaccharide, and we're going to link them together with another monosaccharide. And now I have two, so this is what I mean by a disaccharide. Disaccharide is made of two monomers of sugars, or two monosaccharides. Disaccharides are made of two monosaccharides, join together. And if you remember, they're going to join together by which process? Is it dehydration synthesis or is it hydrolysis? So hopefully you've answered dehydration synthesis is going to pull out water and these monomers are now going to be bonded together. A couple disaccharides to maybe remember is sucrose. Sucrose is a common one. It's table sugar. And I just wanted to show you here the, the structure of sucrose. So you can see it's made of, here's one monomer, and here's another one. Now, I just stated that monosaccharides are used to make these disaccharides. And here they are right here. If you add a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule, then you're going to end up with sucrose. And the other disaccharide that we're going to mention is lactose. And lactose, again, is that sugar that's found in milk. And some people have a difficult time digesting the sugar or breaking up the sugar into monosaccharides. The two monosaccharides that you're going to find in lactose is glucose and galactose. And that's why I indicated that I mentioned galactose when I'm talking about monosaccharides because I have to reference it when I'm teaching you about lactose, a disaccharide. And again, these two monomers are joined together through a dehydration synthesis reaction. And that's what I have written here and shown for you. So they're joined together by dehydration synthesis. So hopefully this diagram makes sense to you. We're going to put glucose with the fructose. In that process, we're going to remove water. And now we have a disaccharide, which is called sucrose. And we have that water molecule that was removed. So the third type of carbohydrates we're going to look at are the polysaccharides. And poly means many. So when we're thinking of the structures of polysaccharides, think of stringing more than three monosaccharides together, and you're going to end up with a really big molecule that we're going to call polysaccharide. It's a carbohydrate. We've mentioned that monosaccharides were known as uh, simple sugars. I'm also going to, I'm going to go back here because I don't think I have that written down. Disaccharides also, I'm just going to put it right here, are also known as simple sugars. Pretty small molecules, they're not very complex. If you put them on your tongue, they're going to taste sweet. So monosaccharides are simple, disaccharides are simple, but your polysaccharides are considered complex molecules, or sometimes we call them complex carbs. And they will not taste sweet. If you are concerned with your diet, then you probably have heard that nutritionists will suggest that you have complex carbs in your diet and not so many simple sugars or simple carbs. Your complex carbs aren't going to taste sweet. Potato has a complex carb in it, starch. Starch doesn't taste sweet. These are the polysaccharides that I need you to be able to tell me about their structures, where you would find these molecules, and what purposes they serve, because you're going to see them in other units. So the first one we're going to talk about is starch. And I just mentioned that um, you can find starch in potatoes, you can find starch in corn. That starch is a molecule that plants use to store their energy. So starch is stored energy for plants. 
And in a second, I'm going to tell you about a polysaccharide that's stored energy for animals. And you're included as an animal. You do not store your energy as starch, but plants do. When plants are doing photosynthesis all day long, they're making glucose. They have to use that glucose for energy 24-7, so they need to even use glucose at night for energy. These excess glucose molecules that are made during the day are actually pieced together through dehydration synthesis, and they form a molecule of starch. So when I'm looking at the starch molecule, it's really a polymer of glucoses. So every single one of these individual little molecules is a glucose molecule that's joined together. Later on, when a plant needs glucose, maybe it's been without uh, sun, so it can't manufacture glucose, then it can actually break off these, or break up these, the starch molecule into individual glucoses and use those for energy. So plants store their, their excess glucose as starch, and animals are going to store their excess glucose as glycogen. So again, glycogen is also made of glucose monomers. Whenever you uh, eat a meal with carbohydrates, you're going to break those carbs down into glucose molecules. You're not going to need to use all those glucose molecules right at that second. And so your body will actually link them together into molecules of glycogen. And they're going to store that glycogen in your liver. So when you're in between meals, four hours after breakfast, you actually have a glucose supply. Your glycogen is going to be broken up into individual glucose molecules. And those glucose molecules are going to be delivered to your blood and they'll circulate to your cells. You probably heard of people that are diabetic and it has to deal with uh, blood sugar levels. Insulin is actually the molecule that signals these liver cells to break down that glycogen into glucose and to release that glucose into the blood because your cells are lacking glucose at that moment. The next polysaccharide we're going to address is cellulose. And cellulose is the primary carbohydrate that makes up cell walls in plants. Now, lots of times when we've drawn a, a plant molecule, you know, we've put a very thin cell wall, and then we put that membrane right inside of it. But for most plants, that cell wall is actually pretty thick. And so this diagram gives you a better idea of just how thick that cell wall is. And so this cell wall is primarily made of cellulose. Now, the paper that you're taking notes on right now is primarily cellulose. When we make paper, we crush these plant cells. Uh, most of the cytoplasm is, is going to be leak out because that paper is going to get, those crushed cells are going to get pressed. The cytoplasm, everything else is, is leaks out, and what you're left over with is that cellulose. Again, cellulose, just like glycogen and starch, it's a polymer of glucoses. When plants are making glucose all day, they turn some of it into starch, and they take some of it and they store it, or they turn it into a cellulose molecule, and that cellulose molecule, again, makes up that structure of that cell wall. Now, plants aren't the only thing that have cell walls. We're going to talk about fungi in a different unit. Fungi has cell walls. And those cell walls are made of a complex carb or a polysaccharide called chitin. We also find chitin in the exoskeleton of insects. Right, exoskeleton in arthropods. And arthropods are a group where you find insects and crustaceans. Think of lobsters. If you've ever stepped on a beetle and you heard that crunch, you're breaking the exoskeleton of that insect and it is made of chitin. Now, I did throw a, a picture up here of chitin and you can see here chitin does have nitrogen. I'm never going to ask you to recognize a molecule of, of chitin. If you see um, molecules like this and they're linked together and it looks like these molecules are in chain form, Sometimes um, they're branched, as you can see uh, here with glycogen. Glycogen is, is not just a, a single row of glucose molecules. It's actually glucose that will branch off of glucose. You need to recognize that you're looking at a complex carbohydrate. And then the last one that we're going to talk about, we said plants have cell walls. We also mentioned that bacteria have cell walls in pre-AP. The 
carbohydrate that makes up that cell wall is different. It's not cellulose. It's peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan. And so if we zoom here on this cell wall and, and cell membrane of this bacteria cell, this is what we mean by there's that cell wall there, and it's primarily made of carbohydrate called peptidoglycan. Now, from here, I'm going to head back to that page, which is going to show you the structures of these four different types of organic molecules all on one page, um, just so that you can kind of reference and compare and contrast the structures of these different organic molecules. Just focusing on that carbohydrate box, remember we said that we primarily need carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen to make these molecules in a one to two to one ratio. Now, I'm just going to let a simple circle represent a molecule. In this case, one circle equals one monomer. And remember, the monomers of carbohydrates are monosaccharides. And what I have here are actually the three pictures are of glucose, fructose, and galactose. So we're going to take these monosaccharides and we're going to build bigger molecules. We're going to build the disaccharides and we're going to build the polysaccharides. Here's a monosaccharide and I hook it together through dehydration synthesis to another monosaccharide and that molecule is now called a disaccharide. So as an example, if I take glucose and it is joined to fructose, that I now have a disaccharide with a new name, which is sucrose. Remember that sucrose was table sugar. Remember, your monosaccharides and your disaccharides are considered, considered simple sugars. They're going to taste sweet. So now we're going to take many monosaccharides. So let's write monosaccharides, and we're going to put plus three. So that means three or more is going to make these big, long molecules that we consider polysaccharides. And again, these monosaccharides are joined together through the process of dehydration synthesis. Let's go through these polysaccharides and see what you can remember about them. So remember, plants are making an excess of glucose all day long, and they can store that and use that glucose in different ways. So they can take these thousands of glucose molecules. So let's write thousands of glucoses. They can join them together and you have a molecule of starch. That is stored energy, stored glucose molecules. They can take thousands of glucoses and they can string them together a different way and you get cellulose. And I want to highlight that these two molecules are related to plants, not animals. Now let's kind of put maybe a, a line here to kind of separate the two because you eat food that contains glucose and then you have an excess of glucose and you can take those thousands of glucose molecules and you string them together into a molecule glycogen. And you're going to store that glycogen in your liver for whenever you need glucose later on in the day. The other two that I'm going to mention here, the chitin and the peptidoglycan, their, their structures are more complex. There's, there's more to them. And so I'm, you're not going to have to look at a picture of chitin and, and be able to identify that as a chitin molecule. So let's just add chitin so that you remember chitin is a polysaccharide since this section has to do with the polysaccharide. Um, chitin has to do with uh, fungi. It's in the cell wall of fungi in the exoskeleton of insects and crustaceans, which are called arthropods. You can put insects if you want. That's fine. Peptidoglycan. And peptidoglycan is considered, it's considered a polysaccharide, and we're going to find that in the cell walls of bacteria. So those are the main things that you need to remember about those polysaccharides is uh, for, for some of them, starch, cellulose, glycogen, they're all made of glucose. Just thousands of the glucose is strung together in different ways. Starch and cellulose is related to plants. Glycogen is related to animals. Chitin is related to fungi and those arthropods. And then the cell walls of bacteria are made of peptidoglycan.
we did study these molecules in pre-AP, so hopefully some of them uh, ring a bell and you don't have to commit them all to memory.